On 5 News, plane crash tragedy. 76 people are killed as an aircraft carrying a Brazilian football team crashes in Colombia. Also tonight, child abuse scandal. The FA chief says it faces one of the biggest crises in its history. Cracking down on business fat cats, the government unveils its plans. The world's oldest woman celebrates her 117th birthday and helping the hedgehogs who are at risk as the cold weather begins to bite. Hello and welcome to 5 News, I'm Sean Williams. 76 people, including members of one of Brazil's top football teams, have been killed after a chartered plane lost power and crashed in Colombia. Shortly before boarding the plane, the Chapacoense manager had described the trip as the club's most important to date. Of the 81 people on board, only five are thought to have survived. Brazil has announced three days of mourning. Well, the plane was flying from Sao Paulo in Brazil via a stopover in Santa Cruz in Bolivia. It crashed on the approach to Colombia's Medellin airport. Julian Druca has the story. In the Colombian mountains, the grim sight of the plane which smashed into them and broke into two. On board, amongst its 81 passengers, a top Brazilian football team traveling to the country for the biggest game in their history. This police video shows rescue teams desperately searching for signs of life. When you see the twisted seats and torn fuselage, it's hard to believe that anyone could survive such carnage. But incredibly, five people did. This was the Chapacoense squad in the departure lounge. Their chartered aircraft was carrying 72 passengers and nine crew. In what is now one of the triumphant team's last photos together, it's not clear if this is the ill-fated plane behind them. On this video, filmed on part of their journey, goalkeeper Danilo Padilla on the left died. His teammate, Alain Rouchel, is one of the three players who survived. He was taken to hospital along with a journalist and one of the flight crew. Today, as the investigation continued into the disaster, apparently caused by an electrical fault, Brazil started three days of mourning. A única coisa que podíamos fazer the country's president, Michel Temer, said, sadly, all we can do beyond crying for those who have left us is to arrange government support for the families who are in mourning. The club had been living a football dream since entering Brazil's top division for the first time in 2014. The upcoming match they were travelling to was seen as the biggest in the history of the relatively small side. As the news sunk in, their fans across Brazil and the world have paid tribute. The team's badge was saved from the wreckage, but so many of its members have proved more mortal. Julian Drucker, 5 News. Theresa May made tackling corporate greed a key priority when she got the keys to number 10. And today, the government set out its plans to do it. The measures include making businesses reveal the gap in earnings between chief executives and average employees. It follows public anger over the treatment of staff at Sports Direct and the pensions crisis after the BHS sell-off. Our political editor, Andy Bell, has more. The London skyline displays the evidence of just how much money British business has made. But have the employees who've helped generate all that been shortchanged as the bosses have paid themselves more? The government says yes. When you have seen uh, an escalation in pay at the top that's gone beyond uh, the performance of companies, that's gone beyond uh, what ordinary workers uh, have been paid, uh, then of course people uh, are uh, critical and, um, uh, and uh, want action. So the government's suggesting bosses should publish their salaries to allow them to be compared with the average employee salary, that there should be some form of worker and customer representation on company boards, and that this should apply to privately owned companies, ones that don't have any public shareholders. 
Pimlico Plumbers is owned by the founder, Charlie Mullins, and he is quite happy to publish what he pays himself. Transparency, you can't beat transparency. And uh, what, what really worries me is some of these uh, bosses that don't want to ex um, um, show their money that they're actually earning, I just wonder whether there's something in it or whether they're not worth it. I'm very proud to uh, admit how much I earn. All my workers know about it, and I think it makes us a better company. All right, how much is it then that you earn? A million pound. That is more than 30 times the average of what his employees earn. So what do they think of it? I think it's great. I think it should be an open book. Everyone should know what each other earns and where you fit in within the scale of your, your company. If it's their company, then they should just tell everyone, be open about it. There's no shame in it. The Prime Minister talks about an irresponsible minority of bosses, and it's no secret she has people like Sir Philip Green, former owner of BHS, and Mike Ashley, the owner of Sports Direct in Mind. The government thinks more transparency over pay might change behaviour. Perhaps, others say, but a simple comparison of bosses and workers' salaries is the wrong answer. You could have a company, for example, that made a point of investing very generously in training and development for employees, in good maternity packages, good annual leave packages, but pay them a bit less, versus a company that doesn't do any of that but just pays a bit more. You know, the, the, the second company would look better on Never. a pay ratio. Is that really what we want? There is a widespread belief business has not benefited everyone fairly. The government is now working out if this is the way to change that. Andy Belt, 5 News. The United States has admitted carrying out an airstrike which killed Syrian forces fighting so-called Islamic State. A military investigation concluded a series of unintentional human errors led to the coalition strike on the 17th of September. Aircraft from the UK, the US, Denmark and Australia were all involved in the attack. Here it's claimed Royal Navy ships are being kept in service beyond their sell-by date. An independent review also found that new ships are ordered too late, depleting the Navy and costing taxpayers money. It's recommended that work on warships should be shared among companies across the UK. And police have released CCTV footage of a violent road rage incident on the M62 in Eccles in Greater Manchester. It shows the driver of a truck deliberately reversing into a lorry before smashing the vehicle's window with a spade. Police are appealing for witnesses to the attack. It happened on the 9th of November. NHS executives are now more worried about a lack of staff than they are about funding. That's according to a new survey of trust leaders in England. It revealed a growing concern that they don't have enough people or skills to deliver high-quality health care. And bosses at one hospital have also told Five News they're worried about the impact Brexit could have on recruitment. Our health correspondent Catherine Jones reports. Let me go and speak to on Ward 16 at Milton Keynes Hospital today, a full complement of doctors and nurses are at work. It's tough achieving this day in, day out, with managers needing to rely on staff doing extra shifts. When we do have gaps on our rotors, our, our preference is to try and fill those gaps our own staff where possible. And we have arrangements using a, using a, bank, a bank arrangement where people are um, rewarded and remunerated fairly for those hours that, that they're done. And where possible, we're using our own staff to do additional hours in a way that's, that's still safe. Not having enough staff has now replaced not having enough money as the chief concern of hospital bosses. Recent figures show 10% of nurses' posts and 14% of midwife posts in England are vacant, while our own investigation earlier this year uncovered a 7% vacancy rate for hospital doctors. In some places, staff shortages have even led to department closures. Grantham Hospital's A&E is no longer open overnight for that reason and the Children's Emergency Department at Stafford County Hospital has closed completely. And it seems Brexit is making a bad situation worse. A number of hospitals report a slowdown in applicants from the EU and the boss at Milton Keynes says they're losing valuable staff too. We have seen some European members of staff decide to go back home and to go and work back in their home countries. That's disappointing and it obviously creates vacancies here that we need to fill and we are fortunate here at Milton Keynes that we are able to fill those. But I know that's not the case across the whole of the country. So the matron would say, I need another nurse tonight. Yes. So it's a professional assessment by the nurses yes. on, the, on the ward in terms of how sick the patients yeah. are. Milton Keynes has just been given a quality rating of good, which will help attract the staff it needs. But in hospitals across England, staff shortages have now become an urgent problem. Catherine Jones, 5 News.
Coming up on 5 News, we've got more developments for you on the child abuse scandal in football. Stay with us for that also. She's 117 years old, so what's the secret of this lady's good health? And why there's been a spike in the number of hedgehogs needing help to hibernate. We'll see you after the break. Hello and welcome back. You're watching 5 News. In the last few minutes, it's emerged the football coach at the centre of the child sex abuse scandal has been charged with eight offences of sexual assault. It comes as the chairman of the Football Association admitted the crisis is one of the biggest in its history and that he doesn't know whether the allegations were covered up in the past. Greg Clark says he's determined to be open about how the scandal is dealt with now. Well, let's talk to our chief news correspondent, uh, Tessa Chapman. What can you tell us, Tessa? This is a fast-developing story, Sean. I can tell you what the Crown Prosecution Service has told us just in the last 15 minutes. We have a statement. They say, on the 27th of September 2016, we received a file of evidence from Cheshire Police relating to allegations of non-recent child sexual abuse involving a former football coach, Barry Burnell. They go on to say, following a review of the evidence in accordance with the Code for Crown Prosecutors, Mr Burnell, who's 62, has today been charged with eight offences of sexual assault against against a boy under the age of 14. Now, they go on to say that these um, are a combination of indecent assaults and incitement to commit acts of gross indecency. We can't expand any more on that, but we can tell you tonight that criminal proceedings are underway. Tessa, thank you. Former darts world champion Eric Bristow has been sacked as a television pundit over comments that he made about footballers in relation to the abuse scandal. He's now been dropped by Sky Sports after he suggested on Twitter that victims are not proper men if they fail to stand up to their abusers in later life. He went on to say footballers are wimps while darts players are tough guys. Now, if you want to know the secret to a long life, then do keep watching because... Emma Murano just might have some tips for you. She's celebrating her 117th birthday today and that makes her officially the oldest person in the world. And she puts her longevity down to a combination of good genes and a rather unusual diet, Warren Nettleford explains. This is a very special birthday for Emma Murano. There's not enough room here for all the candles to match her age. These numbers will do though. That's right, 117 years old. Once upon a time, singing happy birthday for her would have been very easy. I had a beautiful voice, she said. Born in northern Italy in 1899 during the Boer War and not long after the birth of radio, she was the oldest of eight children. Mussolini was in power when she left her abusive husband in 1938 and her only son died at just six months old in the same year. Cake is on the menu today, but she puts her amazing longevity down to her regular diet of three eggs, two of them raw, for the past 90 years. Ever since I've known her, she's eaten very few vegetables, very little fruit. The main feature is that she always eats the same things, every day, every week, every month of every year. She may have retired 50 years ago, but she remembers the world of work. My life has not been very good. I worked until I was 65 years old. I worked in a factory, then that was that. As she's outlived all of her family, today she was surrounded by friends, cherishing her record-breaking life. Warren Nettleford, 5 News. Now, it's emerged the new plastic £5 note is not suitable for vegetarians. It turns out the plastic polymer it's made from contains tallow, which is derived from animal waste products. Thousands of people have signed a petition calling for the contents of the notes to be changed. They are one of Britain's best-loved garden animals. There's a warning tonight, though, that many baby hedgehogs could struggle to get through the current cold snap. Wildlife rescue centres have had an influx of undernourished hedgehogs, or hoglets, as the babies are officially known. Experts say they're caring for hundreds more than they would usually see at this time of year. Minnie Stevenson's been to one sanctuary to find out more. 
Meet the baby hedgehogs or hoglets who are so small they are struggling to survive this winter. Across Britain, wildlife centres have been inundated with the number of newborns who are born too late in the season to make it through hibernation without help. Now this is Peace. As you can see, she's extremely cute and she's only eight weeks old. Now a healthy hedgehog should weigh just over 500 grams, but Peace here weighs just 250 grams and that's too tiny to survive in the wild. She's a bit of a poser, isn't she? Wildlife experts say the milder weather earlier this year has led to later births than usual, which means the hedgehogs are too small to fend for themselves in the wild. Here at One Hedgehog Hospital in Berkshire, Gillian Lucraft told me the amount of hoglets they've taken in this year has more than doubled. Now you've been rescuing hedgehogs for over a decade now. Have you seen anything like this before? Never, never. We normally get large numbers in at this time of year, um, but they're usually a lot bigger than this. We, we've not really had anything like the small numbers of small hedgehogs that, uh, that have been coming in this year. Well, the first thing we do is obviously check them over for injuries and things like that, but because they're so small, um, normally they're put onto heat. Uh, we keep them in a cage and we feed them up until they get to a decent weight for release back in spring, but um, they, ca they can't go out during the winter. There are, it's estimated, just under a million hedgehogs living in Britain. But since the 1950s, the prickly population has declined by more than 30 million. It's thought intensive farming has left few places for the animals to forage and set up home. For a species in decline, it seems this winter, one of Britain's most loved animals is once again under threat. Minnie Stevenson, Five News. Now, before we go, Matt's joined us to tell us what's coming up on Five News tonight. Hello. Hi, Jean. Thanks very much indeed. We will, of course, have more on those charges for former football coach Barry Burnell. We'll also be discussing whether the morning after pill should be more easily available. A healthcare charity has said that the high cost of the pill and the personal questions women have to answer before they can buy it are patronising and off-putting. But pharmacists say it's important women have a conversation with a healthcare professional. We'll be debating those issues. Also, we'll be talking to keen amateur dancer Fred Walden. Now, Fred's been competing in dancing competitions like these for 15 years, but he is now launching legal action after being told by one event organiser that he had to leave the dance floor as his wheelchair was damaging it. Fred will be here with me, Sean, mm. at 6.30. Interesting issue. Thank you very much, Matt. See you a little bit later on. That is it for now, though. Claire Nazir has the weather next and details of what could be a very cold night for many of you. I'll see you again tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Matt, of course, is back at 6.30. Thanks for watching tonight. Goodbye for now.